Um, well, uh, first of all, thank you all for uh, coming out on this Thursday evening. Um, I've done a few of these and man, that's, uh, that's good numbers. <laughs> 50 odd people uh, come to watch some old geezer talk about bikinis. Um, so um, Kieran's given me a brief uh, just to tell you who I am. Um, basically, uh, first and foremost, I'm a scuba diver um, and that, that is my life's passion. Uh, tattoos, drums, vodka being the other ones, perhaps a little guy called Sebastian. Uh, I'm based in Bournemouth right now, um, but I live most of my life in London. Um, and up until um, recent times, uh, quite a lot of my time in an aeroplane as well. Um, I, I, as you know, I'm the president of RAID, but I'm not here in a RAID capacity at all. Um, I'm here to talk to you just as another diver. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about one of the, the coolest kind of expeditions. Uh, I, I did the inverted commas because it is an expedition just purely because of where it is in the world, even though it's been dived many, 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 many times. Um, I've made the presentation really graphic rich. Um, hopefully there's a few laughs in there as well. Um, it's, uh, it's the most amazing place in the world to go to um, above land and uh, below water. And it's, um, it is, as far as I know, I, I do stand corrected, it is the, the most re remote place that a scuba diver can go to um, ocean-wise. Um, so what I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll share my screen. There we go. And uh, I'll make this big oh, and share. And hopefully that's all working. Is that working, Karen? Yeah, it's working. Okay, superb. Um, so a dramatic little um, image there, uh, which is uh, an image of one of the, the bombs going off in bikini. Uh, the presentation is called Tools on Tour, uh, primary, primarily because of uh, Professor Simon Mitchell, who was the uh, kind of medical advisor on, on the trip. Uh, this is one of those trips where you, you, you don't want to go out there without someone who's capable of, of giving some form of hyperbaric help uh, and general uh, medical help because it is so, it's so, so, so remote. Um, the tools on tour comes from a, from a story that Professor Mitchell told us about. Um, his wife went to a dive center and um, Simon had been commenting in a forum and the bloke, in, the bloke had been commenting back and an argument ensued between Simon and this, this, this individual. And um, the conversation came up while Simon's wife happened to be in the shop and the bloke turned around in a deep Aussie accent and, and said, yeah, that Mitchell's a bloody tool. So anytime, anytime uh, Simon is mentioned and me and Pete Mesley, it's, uh, it's always tools on tour. So that's where the, the title comes from, just in case you were wondering. Uh, right, so let me just click on there and then hopefully we'll move forward. Uh, so, the, the, as I said, Bikini is super, super remote. So, uh, going there, you kind of got to take everything that you need. Um, and uh, if you start with just booking your travel, for me, I, I left London. So, I went from London to Tokyo, uh, from Tokyo to Guam from Guam to Kwajalein via Ch Chuk and uh, Pompeii. And uh, then you arrive in Kwajalein and then you get on your uh, exploration or expedition vessel or boat, and then you head out to Bikini Atoll. Um, so we, we took masses of kit with us. Uh, I flew out there with two Irish friends of mine who uh, I've worked out how they managed to take two scooters, um, two rebreathers, spares for those rebreathers, uh, cylinders, cameras, regulators, dry suits, you know, wet suits, the whole nine yards. Uh, because what they do is when they get to the airport, they have uh, one bag that's going on as hand luggage and they check in individually. And one guy hides behind uh, uh, like a, a, a pillar in the airport with all the stuff that they're going to sneak onto the plane. The other one goes and checks in and then they, they swap roles. Uh, I was a little naive at that time, but I, I have learned how to how to get mammoth amounts of kit onto airplanes now. So that's, uh, that, that's actually not the kit I took to, um, to Bikini, but it's, it's not far off what you have to take. Uh, you don't have to take, I didn't have to take Softener Line. 
Um, there was a lot of guys who shipped their kit out there as well. Um, so uh, several months before they went, they just shipped off their rebreather. Um, and when they got there, the rebreather had magically appeared on the boat. Um, there, are, there are spares out there, but again, you're on an exploration vessel. So we had to take bags of spares, uh, O-rings, cells, uh, spare handsets, spare head up, head up displays. Um, when I went out there, I dived on JJ and uh, Jan from JJ was absolutely brilliant because he sent us a loner handset and a loner head up display in case anything went down while we were there. And as luck would have it, um, we did lose uh, um, a controller. A uh, controller got severed while we were going through one of the wrecks and uh, the loner came out and saved the day. Uh, you can just imagine on day three, you've traveled 81 hours to get to Bikini no one is turning that boat around because you don't have a handset. So you have to sit there and listen to them regale stories about these, these awesome uh, atomic bricks. Uh, I don't think anyone would be too chuffed. The accommodation, uh, basically on the boat that we went to, 12 people slept, slept in one room. And basically what you've got is you've got these bunks which are like buried in the walls and they've got so curtains on them. And at the bottom of your bunk is a little cubby hole area. Uh, there is electricity and in actual fact we found it immensely comfortable and then in the middle of the room was all the cameras because you can imagine everyone took tons of camera stuff uh, and that was kind of our area for for setting up camera and then all the dive kit was on the decks there was no settling of equipment downstairs in the rooms uh, and surprisingly was was really very very comfortable on the boat the one thing about this trip was we had a, a chef um, sent straight by god himself um, we caught a, uh, a marlin while we were out there and uh, after about two or three hours of fighting a, a shark took the, the bottom off the marlin um, so we landed it and the chef made us tempura marlin for the, for the next two or three days. Um, the food was, was absolutely extraordinary and the team um, that we happened to go, go with again were extraordinary people, no arguments, no bad words. Uh, you can imagine being that far from home and you, you're not getting home for two weeks minimum uh, and you've got some guy on the on the boat who causes trouble. Uh, we didn't have any of that. It was, it was, it was just super blissful. Um, so I don't know why that picture there won't play. Oh, there we go. Um, so this is, um, I pulled this off uh, Pete Misley's site. Uh, this, is, this is the kind of trip that I took. So I'm at LHR where I live. And then went around to Japan, down to Guam, spent the night in Guam, and then the next day took the little plane down to uh, the, all the islands in the Marshall Islands, ending off at Kwajalein, and then from Kwajalein, 36 hours by boat to get to um, Bikini Atoll. So an immense, immense trip. Um, this is, uh, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor. I don't, I don't know if there's a, uh, but if you can see my cursor, this is Kwajalein. I'll explain Kwajalein in a little bit. Yeah, we can see it. Yeah, fantastic. All right, and then this is the trip that we took uh, up to Bikini Atoll. Uh, and this, this little thing here is 36 hours. Um, absolutely amazing because you see sunrise, sunset. There is nothing around you in areas. Can't see a piece of land, can't see another boat, can't see another human soul. It's just you on this little boat with a crane and a recompression train chamber and 15 rebreathers. It's, it's just utterly epic. I mean, it's absolutely mind blowing. Uh, then, oops, sorry, I'll come back. There we go. So this is Kwajalein. Um, uh, you'll see that it's a, it's a blurred aerial view of the, uh, of the island. Uh, and that's because it's a Pacific missile range facility. So it's uh, inter intercontinental ballistic missiles. Uh, when you arrive at the, uh, at the airport there, you land your plane, you get met, met by a, a rubber glove touting uh, military man. You, you get one each. Um, they give you an interview. Uh, they put their rubber gloves on, they give you a, a thorough checking. Um, <laughs> and then you get uh, ushered to a, a typical um, big American panel van where you and your gear get thrown in the back. You get driven down to the ferry port, your equipment goes through and that's it. There's no more walking around the island. Um, and then you get on a, a little uh, Vietnam, um, one of those beach landing craft that used to deploy the troops. It's a little Vietnam two-stroke that's been adapted um, for taking people to Ebai and various islands around there. You get taken over to your boat, you climb onto your boat, and 
this is what you met with. So that's our vessel. As you can see, it's not exactly salubrious, but it worked. It was, it was, just, it was just spot on. Um, by the time you're about three hours out from there, there is no signal, there's no phones, there's no internet, there's no Wi-Fi. You're totally disconnected from the world. Um, so Pete takes a satellite phone and he records your minutes and hours because obviously going on a sat phone is ex extremely expensive. Um, and I made one or two calls to my wife because our son had just been born when I decided to um, leave her at home, <laughs> bugger off to bikini. Um, and then this is the back view. You can see there's a crane up there. Um, and uh, on the right of the vessel, just behind that guy peeking his head out from over the row of rebreathers, um, there's a recompression chamber on the deck there as well. And in this next photo, um, you can see he's the, he's the, the chief deck man. Uh, he tells you when you can get in and out of the water, uh, usually by barking an order, pools open, and then there's a mad rush. Uh, I'm setting up my rebreather, sitting in the middle of the floor there, and over on the right-hand side is the recompression chamber, um, which, uh, thank God, never, uh, never uh, got used. So let's get into the history. Um, that's one of the bombs going off. As you can see, that is um, some mammoth, mammoth affair. Yeah, you know those uh, little ferries I was talking about? There's one parked right there where my cursor is spinning around. Um, that's one of the things that we got on to get to our ferry. Um, it's Karen, sorry, I missed that raid logo there. Uh, right, so the, the big orange arrow in the middle of that picture that you can see there, that is a 200 plus meter warship going straight up the side of that wave. Um, for the life of me, I can't remember the name of it. I've, I've been told a thousand times what it was, but I, I can't remember it. But that's a warship going straight up vertical in the air. So you can imagine the size of these bombs. Uh, and, in, and typical uh, for humans, we only put let off these A-bombs in, um, uh, in paradise, right? Um, we couldn't let them off somewhere less salubrious than this beautiful place. So just uh, uh, Operation Crossroads is uh, kind of the start of the, the Cold War. And you can see in New Mexico in 1945, the first A-bomb was detonated. And then you had Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And then the fourth and fifth bombs were Abel and Baker, which are the two bombs that put most of these wonderful wrecks uh, on the ocean floor. Now, the, the idea behind this was that the Americans wanted to know what a bomb detonated um, an aerial atom bomb would do to the um, Navy ships and what a, a bomb detonated underneath the water would do to the ships. So what they did was they put 95 ships um, and all they did to those ships was they, they removed people, of course, um, and, uh, you know, certain um, important, um, th uh, you know, things off the boat, but they left they left all, you know, they left um, all the navigation and the radar and on certain of them, they left bombs, they left all the guns, they left everything. So they were, you know, proper um, working warcraft. Um, and in that you had four US battleships, two aircraft carriers, and we're going to do a wonderful trip around the one aircraft carrier in a minute. Two cruisers, 11 destroyers, eight submarines and three surrendered German and Japanese vessels, and then numerous amphibious and auxiliary vehicles. So it was a, it was a they really wanted to see what these things would do to them um, uh, while they were in the water. Uh, that picture that you see in the lower right, you can see all of the, the ships sitting around as the bomb is detonated. Um, quite um, sad, actually, that you have seen that kind of shockwave just in the last two days um, up in uh, Lebanon. So the Abel bomb was detonate, detonated on the 1st of July, 46. Um, it was detonated 158 meters above sea level. It was 23 kiloton. Five ships went down, 14 were seriously damaged. All ships hit within, were within a 900 meter radius of the blast. And the Saratoga, which is the aircraft carrier, which we will visit, um, was hit with fire, um, but it was put, put out and then readied for Baker. All right, Baker's target ships were the amphibious vehicles, the Arkansas. In actual fact, I think that bomb going up the side is the, uh, is the sorry, the Arkansas, is the Arkansas. There were Pilot Fish Submarine, there was the Saratoga, which indeed went down, the Nagato, which is just absolutely incredible, and the Apagon Submarine. 
and uh, I got to dive um, most of those. I got to dive a couple of subs, the Arkansas, Saratoga, Nagato, and Apagon. Uh, absolutely just amazing um, diving. Um, the beautiful thing about bikini is we're talking about beautiful, beautiful water, um, 30 degrees, 32 degrees um, C. So literally like getting into your bath. Um, by the time you get to your decompression, it's like boiling. Um, people are peeling off la layers. Um, most of the, a lot of the guys were diving in shorties. There was only one guy in a dry suit, um, and that was all about getting his trim because um, like a, a lot of rebreather divers trying to get trim in a two millimeter wetsuit means you have to kind of put weights on your head to get your feet up. Um, but this, uh, this dive here is the, the checkout dive. Here we're still moored up at Kwajalein, um, so we can see the military base in front of us. And when you arrive at the site, there's these propellers sticking out of the water, um, which are almost up the beach. The guys who are fortunate enough to be um, seconded to the military base at Kwaj, this is their fun dive. Um, so it goes from pretty much naught meters to 32 meters. It's, I think, 230 meters long. It's upside down. It's full of sharks and all sorts of other fish. Um, it is utterly, utterly astonishing. I mean, you can't believe how lucky you are when you go and this is the checkout dive. Honestly, I could, if I didn't manage to get to Bikini, I could have done two weeks just on that because when you penetrate, uh, it's all upside down and it's still full of everything in the kitchen and, uh, and, and there are still candelabras uh, lying on the floor because it's upside down. The guns, you can stick your head in, in, into the barrels of the guns. Some of them have fallen out and are lying on the floor. It's just the most tremendous, tremendous dive. Um, and as you can see, you can see the surface right there, and that's one of the props. You can actually see on the left-hand side, the upper prop is actually breaking the surface. Um, so utterly mind-blowing dive. Um, and just, just some nice images of us uh, flitting around on the, on the wreck. All right. So... We get to the USS Saratoga. Um, I'm sure all of you have heard about the Saratoga. The Saratoga is an aircraft carrier. Funnily enough, um, I heard an interesting story that a modern aircraft carrier could have the Saratoga uh, times one and a half sat on the deck. Uh, that's how big a modern aircraft carrier is. I can tell you that when your face sits over the deck and you can see two football fields going down in front of you, then the bridge and then another two football fields. It is utterly astonishing. She lies in, uh, under the props is about 60 meters. Um, lots and lots of fish life on it, but obviously all, all everyone's interested in here is, is getting into the bridge and getting inside the wreck. Um, and just, you know, just the vastness of this thing. Um, so this is the blueprints um, and showing you the damage. Um, you can see where she was crumpled, um, where, I'm pointing here. Um, a lot of this has been damaged, um, but you can get in here. Um, but where it gets really, really exciting, once you've got over the thrill of swimming across the decks, um, what's really exciting is when you get inside and especially going through here because there's, there's some incredible stuff on board. Um, I took one dive with my, with my buddy where we went down here um, where the props were and you can actually penetrate through there where my cursor is. Um, we had scooters. Um, and there's a hell diver lying on the floor over here. And we went over the hell diver. Hell diver is a, a fold up wing airplane. And there's quite a few inside her as well. That's how stocked they were. They wanted to see absolutely what damage it would make. And we went down here and we went through these props here. And this is where we realized that although it is declared that the radioactivity is, is not that fierce for, um, for us humans, it has certainly affected the sharks and I came under attack here. Now, what had happened was, uh, as we swam along here, I swam through the little gap and I, I, I did a turn and I could see in uh, my buddy's head up display that he had three red flashing lights, which on, on an old JJ means you're in low set point. So I signaled to him that he's bumped a button and he's engaged low set point. So he's piddling around getting it back up to set point because when he looks down at his dive computer, he's now got for like 500 days of decompression to go, um, rather than what we were normally doing, which was about 180 minutes, maybe 200 minutes for each dive <clears throat> that we do. Uh, and I scooted through there to be met by two 
uh, very, very big um, black tips, um, nictitating membranes rolled back, teeth out, and I literally had to rev them both with the scooter. Of course, when he came out, I had eyes like piss holes in the snow, like, you know, beacons inside my mask. And I'm signaling to him that there's sharks and, uh, you know, we need to watch out and everything. And of course, he thought I was a complete div because he saw nothing while he was changing set point. Uh, but I made it onto the deck rather rapidly, I've got to say. <laughs> I found comfort in being back on the deck. Um, okay, so that's uh, at the... That's her building the Saratoga in, in New York in April 1925, so it's quite an old vessel. And the next slide is the view that I got met with when I dropped down the line, you could see her, and I decided I wanted to come in off the front of uh, the front of the deck. Um, it's 268 meters long, it's 32 meters wide, it's got a draft of 7.4 meters, it's 39,000 tons and it'll do 33 knots. So by modern standards, that's a slug of an old thing. It's, it's pretty tiny by, by modern comparisons. But to be able to dive that thing is, it, it's, it's utterly astonishing when you swim across the deck. Um, as I was mentioning to you before, um, that's one of the hell divers um, that were, has either been flung out of the wreck when, when she got nailed um, or um, was on the deck. Um, we, we couldn't find out uh, what. But when you get down to that, that you know the the wheels are on it. Um, the, there's a bomb in it, so uh, in 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 the in the compartment. Uh, the the props are all smashed in. It's it, it's just a, it really really beautiful. The thing about bikini is you get submarines, you get destroyers, you get warships, you get aircraft carriers, you get aeroplanes, you get everything that. If if any of you on this uh, on on this uh, call are. Uh, wreck fanatics yeah it's just got ev everything you every, every two minutes you, you you've got goosebumps all over your body because there's something else that's just come along to 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 blow your mind uh then we we uh um we go inside um and this is a i think simon took this photo um but this is inside one of the hell divers that's inside the wreck so you can see all the glass is still there all the gauges um the, the control stick the seat um, the wings are folded up on the outside. So you, you, you're inside the Saratoga, which is just something absolutely awesome. There, there is a set of lifts to lift the, um, to lift the planes up onto, onto the deck. They're, they're just off to one side. You've got this feeling of, you know, this enormous vast place. And then the next thing, you've got this feeling of, of, of a really small environment where you're talking about this tiny little airplane. And, and when you see these held hours, they look so minuscule inside that ginormous boat. Um, but you can imagine the goose pimples that come off you when you uh, when you see that. And then in the galley, they've they've left everything for you to see as well. There are pots, there are pans, there are kettles, there's crockery, there's cutlery, there's everything there. They you know they really wanted to get an extent of of the damage, so they they never they never um, made it into a Disneyland wreck. You know if we know that they they they're, they're sinking wrecks all over the world, like the Mighty O and uh, up in Alabama and and places like that where they are, you know, the Mighty O is an aircraft carrier and it's an astonishing dive, but it has nothing inside it to, to make you feel about what it must have been like to be a crewman on that boat, which I think for us wreck fanatics is what we love about wrecks is that we get that feeling of humanity. What must it have been like to, you know, be in the war on this, on this ship? You know, someone ate off that plate, someone used that fork. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's utterly astonishing. Um, the penetration um, uh, on the, the Saratoga is not for the faint of heart. Um, basically, you're limited to two people per penetration because it doesn't matter whether you're in your rebreather and it doesn't matter how gently you move your fins. There is silt on everything. It's on the roof. It's on the walls. Um, me and my buddy, um, we went um, with Pete Mesley down a couple of passageways where there, there were um, shelves on the wall that still had vials of um, heroin and painkillers inside them. You know, so no one's actually stolen anything off. Well, I'm sure there's been stuff stolen, but there's still so much history. We went down this room and I'm going to show you where we went in a second. We were very, very gentle in, in the two rooms we went into. And when we turned out, when we turned around to come out the room, thank God we, you know, we had a line because there was zero visit in front of us. I mean, like zero. I couldn't even see my head up display, which is uh, sitting on my, on my mouthpiece of my rebreather. So I, I had to bring the handset up and smack it to the glass 
so I can see what my my decompression was. It's it's, it's certainly not for the faint-hearted. Also, my my buddy Andrus is is quite a large, um, proportionate man, and uh, he had to bail out of a couple of the passageways. <laughs> I don't know what the average crewman was like on these wrecks, but you you couldn't have been a big, you know, six and a half foot overweight guy. You had to be pretty tiny to run around on this boat. But there are miles and miles and miles of passageways here. You you could do a thousand dives on, on here and not not explore a quarter of this of this wreck. This is what I would call a, a cave equivalent of a wreck dive. All right. So this is taken inside the bridge. Um, so you can swim up a couple of decks, and then you've got all these slots that they, they used to look out of. You've got uh, all the navigation machinery there. You've got um, you, you've got you know, all the portholes lying on the floor. You've basically when you're in there, floating inside there, you feel you can feel the the crew and the skipper walking around you on the boat. It's it's it's, it's pretty amazing. And then um, the the one dive that everybody wants to do is to see the the uh, the helmets with the with the blue lenses, okay, um, which are these two. Um, so obviously on, on many Navy ships, they've, they've got Navy divers. Um, uh, they, they, they used in uh, many different roles. Um, but you can see the silt on the floor there. And if you imagine that layer is actually running up that wall and across the roof. So when Pete Andrus and I turned from here, it, you know, and, and we were trying to be as, as good buoyancy wise as humanly possible, um, we uh, th there, there was zero vis, so um, I, I definitely can't take PJ in here because you know we we just wouldn't even see the helmets in the first place because he'd be nose diving through all of that to you know crawling on his hands and knees to get in there. So PJ, you need to work on your buoyancy a bit there, mate. Um, so the um, the blue lenses, um, I, I I spent a, uh, a couple of years afterwards because nobody told me while I was there why the lenses are blue. And uh, my buddy Phil told me, and he said it's from the heat of the uh, of of the bombs going off. It's blued the lenses, which I, I thought was really really interesting. And then uh, um, got a couple of uh, individual shots of them for you as well, with nice nice lighting up them. They they are absolutely brilliant. Now we do know that um, one helmet has been removed because when we were swimming along the deck. We actually found a helmet on the deck, um, which we then we moved and we hid for fear of someone. Because you can you can private charter a super yacht, go to Bikini and go and dive these. There there, there are no um, laws around around going on on here. If you've got the the finances and the means to go and dive Bikini, you you can you can go out there. So you can imagine many super yachts with lots of very very well trained divers go out here to to play around. So that was a pretty astonishing. And then this is uh, the dentist um, uh, area. Uh, and as you can see, uh, it looks only slightly more grim uh, than my mind would imagine uh, when I go to, to my local dentist. Dentists scare the pants off of me. So, but that when you went in there, that was eerie, eerie, eerie when you went in there. But everything's uh, still in there. You can even see that there are there's utensils and stuff still in the cupboards over here. Um, pretty 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 cool um, spent quite a lot of time swimming around there there are uh, there are many other rooms in here there's a, there's a there's a tool room which has got an electrics panel board where they use lights to test circuits that are around the boat and the light bulbs are still in there um, there are walls full of tools um, when you swim into into some of the ships uh, you can actually see the navigation bowls uh, where the radar would work um, it, I, honestly I could have been out there for six months and I, I still wouldn't have been bored. I was very, very, very sad to leave. Um, so the next one is the Nagato. Um, as you can tell, this was one of the Japanese ships that went out there. Um, this thing is utterly, utterly immense. Um, I have not dived a warship um, that big or, you know, with the amount of guns on it. I've done Scapa Flow, um, but because of the visibility up in Scapa Flow, you don't actually get to um, really uh, mentally understand the size of a dreadnought, but these things are they're just utterly unbelievable. So that's, uh, that's a, an overview of, uh, of the Nagato. Uh, and as you can see, there's guns aplenty on there. So if you're, if you're a real gun lover, um, 
big gun lover. This this thing is amazing. And you, and those cannons on that boat, seriously, they'll you you can you can put half your head down there. Um, so this is my photo of the up to, uh, upturned boat. It's about one of the only photos I've ever taken that could ever be published because I'm an absolutely crap photographer. Um, and that's the the big prop shafts. Um, those props are, I guess, around about two meters per blade, somewhere around there. When the diver swims across there, they look pretty insignificant against the backdrop. So she had 18, 16.1 inch guns, 25.5 inch guns, eight five inch anti-aircraft guns and 98 25 millimeter AA guns. But uh, you can see she's in a bit of state of disrepair there. Um, and uh, that's probably taken either on her way or in bikini. Um, but you can see just, I mean, just look at that bridge. Can you imagine diving around that thing? Now that, if memory serves me well, because your memory blurs when you, when you just see so much action going on all the time. Um, but I think the bridge is lying on the sand. So you, you, yes, it is. So you penetrate it from there and the boat has flipped upside down. So when you, when you swim on it, those guns like are just clinging on for, for grim death and you can swim in between and around all those guns. It's, it's utterly unbelievable. And then when you penetrate it, you kind of, you have to orientate yourself that you're swimming upside down along the inside of the deck. Um, it's, it's pretty astonishing. Now that's one of the sides of the gun. So you can see you can easily fit your head down the end of that thing. And um, that's, uh, that's courtesy of Mr. Mesley or Mr. Mitchell. That's a, that really does put it into, uh, uh, it, it kind of makes it real. Imagine being sitting on some vessel up the road and that thing's firing bombs at you. That's, that must <laughs> scare you to death. Um, then we move on to the USS Lansom. Um, and uh, this, this is quite a small boat, but really, really intriguing to dive. Um, uh, so this one um, launched in 1936, 104 meters long. So by bikini um, kind of numbers, this thing's tiny because um, everything else is in the 200 plus meter mark. So it's 10.5 uh, meters wide, uh, 2.7 uh, meter draft, 1500 tonnage and does 36 knots but you get those on it <clears throat> so you've got one gun director above the bridge um five five inch guns 21 inch torpedo tubes um gun directors aa guns 40 and 20 mil depth charge rolls depth charge projectors the depth charges are lying all over the deck there are 50 mil cow shells lying everywhere there are bombs all over it you know it's just it's it's, it's just untouched and when you see the marine life growing all over it and the sharks swimming in and out of it and schools of fish all over it, it's just utterly, utterly mind blowing, Rick. I am very, very, very pretty. And because it's a bit smaller, you don't get overwhelmed. Um, what, what happens when you go on the bigger wrecks, you, you, you feel the need to swim like billio to get round it so that you can say you've seen the whole wreck. Where in actual fact, what you should do is just concentrate on areas so that you, you don't miss anything. The one lucky thing we had was everyone was wrecked mad, obviously. And we'd have video nights where we replayed, you know, GoPro footage and high, high def footage so that we could see the crap that we'd actually missed when we were swimming around. But when you swim over those, um, those torpedoes, they're just utterly, uh, utterly unbelievable. I mean, that, that's, an, uh, that's an astonishing type uh, a site. And you, you, unfortunately, you just don't see that um, very often anymore. These things have been destroyed and, you know, people have stolen stuff off there and whatever, where there seems to be a huge amount of respect for uh, what goes on in Bikini um, and, 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 and indeed truck as well. Um, that's the inside of a torpedo tube. You just look at the wonderful fish life and aquatic um, organisms growing all over that. So you get the best of both worlds. You can be a, like a, a really fluffy recreational diver and a hardcore tech diver and a hardcore wreck diver and you just get everything while you're out here. So this is a little video of the, uh, of the Lansom. I've uh, just got to use this to get it to work. Um, I haven't laid any, oops, blimey, sorry. Well, you can just see how, how beautiful it is. I, I apologize for everyone's buoyancy, um, but it's bugger hard wearing a rebreather and two bailouts and everything while you're sitting in a one mil wetsuit. 
um, and you, you know, you, you don't have the provisions to really trim yourself beautifully out there. That's the torpedo racks. Let's look at that. How gorgeous is that? I know your microphones are not on, but I can hear you all salivating. It's just so astonishingly beautiful. I mean, the, you can see that the skin started to peel off. Um, and then you you move into the into uh, where the, the latrines are, um, and you can see all the basins and the toilets, um, skipper's desk. I mean, look at that! It's just the Telegraph. That's absolutely amazing. That's Mitchell taking some beautiful photos of the gun. There's a couple, quite a few guys went out with scooters, the lucky sods. Because if you've got a, this, a scooter, is uh, if if you can afford to take a scooter, it's an absolute must. Um, so let me move on. Um, I think I think that actually might be one of mine. It's climbed inside and got a got a beautiful photo of the basin. So, what are the risks of such a trip? Medical support uh, is, uh, is is very very important, uh, and we were super super lucky to have um, Mitchell on board. Um, if any of you have ever met Mitch, you know that he's a very, very kind and very, very um, hilarious man. He's got an absolutely amazing sense of humor. Um, and he's not, um, he doesn't hold back. So if, you, if you're lacking understanding and you've got two weeks sitting, having breakfast, lunch, dinner and dives with that man, um, you, you gain some uh, enormous knowledge. Um, I got bent um, while I was out here. I took a skin bend um, and... I immediately went to Mitch and said that I'd, I, I, I thought I had a bend. He said, yeah, you have. He stuck me on oxygen for 24 hours um, and then gave me all clear to go diving. But what he did at that point was he sat everybody down and spoke to us about the amount of time we were in water and our surface intervals and gradient factors. Really, really enhanced me as, a, as an instructor and as a technical diver. It was just phenomenal working with him. Um, and he is bloody, bloody funny. Uh, and if you if you go on uh, Mitch's trips, I mean um, uh, Simon's trips, uh, you get to work uh, normally with either Andrew or, or Simon. We we were lucky to have Simon, so uh, and it made made all the all the difference. And then topside, um, let's not forget about topside because this is paradise. Um, so we. Me and all the guys, we'd, we were uh, during our sur surface intervals. We take the little tender in and we go walking around the beach because there's a lot of lot of history on the islands, as you can imagine. So these are the observation posts for the for the guys that were sitting um, watching these explosions happen out at sea. Um, if I if I'm correct, um, when they let the when they let uh, Baker go, she ripped a 70 meter deep um, hole in the bottom of the ocean. Um, so. Um, you can imagine how many pairs of Oakley sunglasses those guys were wearing not to be affected by that bomb. It's ferocious bombs. Um, the islands were obviously severely devastated, but now vegetation has grown back and um, the Geiger counters and, and researchers are saying it's actually um, safe to, to go on the island. There are a few people who live on the island now, but most of the inhabitants have moved to an island called Ebai. Um, where they were, um, they were, re they were moved there by the Americans after destroying their uh, their, their home with the bombs. Um, and this is what the beaches look like. You just can't complain about that, can you? you know, so if you if you walk past that guy standing on the beach, I can't remember who that is, but if you walk past him, you kind of feel like you're the only soul on earth. And quite a lot of the time, we'd break off or ask if we could just get some downtime and just go walk by ourselves and walk across the middle of these little islands. And we dropped onto many, many of the uh, little islands. Really, really beautiful. And just look at that, you're the only footprints there. And then uh, we'd, we'd uh, have little briars on the, on the beach, and just have a few drinks, and then the tender would take us back. Um, very, very social, lots of stories and lots of, uh, lots of hilarity, really, really beautiful. And you can imagine the, um, the, the sunsets and the starry nights when you've got no um, when you've got no um, light pollution. Uh, honestly, I, I just I just couldn't believe it. I think the last time I saw stars like that was when I was in a game reserve in South Africa, and we went right into the middle of the game reserve and we lay on the roof of the truck and just watched the stars. It was it was absolutely astonishing. So, 
uh, we went and did these dives at, uh, at this place called um, Shark Alley, uh, primarily because it's uh, full of sharks and it, it's in the shape of an alley. Um, and I was telling you that the sharks down there are, are, are pretty um, wild. Now, you can see the current just from that photo. Unfortunately, I don't have any video from this because I'm this idiot over here, half South African, half British. And this is Pete Mesley, who's half Zimbabwean, half New Zealander. Okay, so what we were doing here was we couldn't find sticks to put our SLRs on and we wanted to get up closer. Now, we just finished a dive here where these sharks were literally pushing us across the bottom. Um, we, we, we went into decompression like a bunch of idiots. Um, there's been numerous stories about um, uh, very um, important uh, scuba divers who've been here and have been muscled around by the sharks and had to climb out the water missing their decompression. Uh, but of course we knew better and uh, we jump into the water. We wanted to go and see the sharks. The sharks um, were very, very ferocious. Uh, every, I don't think there was a single person that didn't get nudged, bashed, kicked, punched. Um, they were all over us like a rash. So we got out of the water and we thought, right, well, what happens if we throw a few tuna heads in? I um, wonder if the sharks can swim against, against the current. Um, and of course, they, they don't even move. They just, they just sit there. So at this point, what Mesley over here and Tuma over here are doing, much to the hilarity of everyone, uh, we are getting this guy over here to drop the tuna head in, and then he pulls the sharks right up. Mesley's just about to have his go. You can see he's got his camera in his hand. I'm just checking how good my photos were. And we'd bring the tuna head right in. We'd, we'd have our cameras in front of the tuna head and he'd pull it out as the shark was biting and the shark would bite the front of the, of the, of the dome on the camera. Um, and um, we, we'd done this for about five minutes when Dr. Mitchell said to us, you pair of bloody idiots, if one of you loses a finger or a hand, that means the end of diving for all of us because I can't put fingers back on and I can't do that kind of work on a boat with a recompression chamber on it. Um, we're going to have to turn around, nurse you, and take you back um, to Kwajalein for medical care. And that's the end of diving for everyone. It's really unfair. So we stood there like two scolded little schoolboys. And uh, we left this area and we went up the deck, which is up here, where Simon's taking the photo from, to what is apparently the safe area. Sometimes God is an amazing guy because he decides just to bat for you at that moment and give you some, you know, some, you know, tell you that in actual fact what you were doing was not that dangerous because there is no safe area. So this bloke's dropped the tuna head and this bunch of sharks decide they want the tuna head. And there's one shark that really, really, really wants that shark. Like really wants that tuna head. Like very, 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 very much. So much so he's now cleared the ladder and he is now in the safe zone. So, uh, and this is at Mitchell's feet, by the way. So uh, you can imagine the laughs that came off me and Mesley when we'd been told that we need to go in the safe zone only to find that Mr. Mitchell now is a shark has <laughs> nearly eaten his feet off. Uh, so yeah, it was, uh, it was good fun all around. Um, so I'll wind off with my final two slides. I, I, honestly, I, I could talk about this for, for months. I, I could talk about any aspect of my diving because, you know, put me in muddy water. I don't care. I just love the diving. But this was an astonishing, astonishing trip. Um, so is it worth it? Um, because it's not cheap to go there. Um, it, it's, it's many, many thousands of dollars. I think, I think I went there in 2013 and I think that cost me seven or eight thousand dollars and that's less extras uh, the flight it, itself was absolutely mammoth and then there's you, you can imagine what it costs to get that boat and fuel it and feed you and everything while you're out there so it was a huge amount of money um but i felt it was worth it and this is me having my kidney removed um just before we went so that i could actually um go on this trip um and then this is my wonderful irish friend He's at home, we're on Ebay Island, and uh, he's just showing us exactly what you do when you're from the United Kingdom and you're abroad. You show the local populace how superior you are, your wonderful physique, physique and you welcome everyone with open, open arms. So winding off, um, I'd like to thank Professor Simon Mitchell and Pete Mesley for the 
wonderful images and and likewise for the wonderful trip because um as you can tell from um the way i'm speaking it was it was a pretty pretty spectacular trip um so i will turn off my screen share um and then if you have any questions uh, i will i will take those um has that worked thank you very much that uh, was awesome even better than the last one i listened to <laughs> um, I'm going to cut the video off because I'm, I'm really struggling with bandwidth over here. Uh, we do have a couple of questions, a couple of repeat questions over here yep. um, from Russ. Um, extra costs for kit on an aeroplane and shipping. Um, the name of the boat, um, is there softener, lime and CCR cylinders provided on board? Um, okay, so uh, let me start at the back. Um, so uh, softener lime is on board. Um, they ship that out in crates um and um they have cylinders on board okay and even um my friends who run the dirty dozen they go out there now pete i don't know if pete's still going out there um but if you google the dirty dozen or lust for rust um you will find out details but i absolutely know that uh, aaron um who runs the dirty dozen go does go out there he will supply um softener lime and he'll supply um cylinders and he'll supply your bailout cylinders you have to pay for the gas in the cylinders whether you use it or not so as you know if you're a rebreather diver you generally if everything goes according to plan you're kind of just giving them their gas back um the that boat i can't remember that the name of that boat basically i, I booked everything through pete Maisley. he took care of everything um from when i got on the plane in guam i got myself to guam um, actually, no, from when I got to Kwajalein, he was waiting on the boat. So I got myself to Guam. Um, the three of us trucked our way down to Quaj. We came out of Quaj, we got the little boat, and Pete was waiting for us there. And he took care of all logistics from that point. Um, what were the other questions in there? Oh, shipping. Uh, no, that's the pretty out of the shipping, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, excess luggage, as you know, is, 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 is utterly fearsome, all right? Um, so you do have to kind of... Um, uh, kind of pick your battles and and unfortunately you're you're in for it so but what you can do is you can just troll all the different airlines that you're going to get and see who who gives you the best um so currently um if you fly with ba for example they they're quite good with their luggage allowance um whereas if you fly with with some of the others you i, I think i went with with um emirates once and uh was i can't remember who it was but they were charging me uh fifty dollars a kilo right whereas what you need to do is you need to get an airline yeah you need to get an airline where you pay per bag now if, if i was doing this again now i'd be really really lucky because i book everything through ba um because of all the travel i do i've got club status um so i i wouldn't worry about that anymore but unfortunately um for most people that's a big worry so you've got to look at the airline and you've really got to delve in and you've got to when it comes to doing something like this you don't just want to take someone's what they've said on the phone or what the website says you need to get hold of them and you need to say i need an email from you telling me that this this and this is good for example when we came back the japan when we got to tokyo in japan they had a hell of a problem with our batteries and thank god we, we we waited about six hours in tokyo before we flew back to london but they brought our bags to us and they made us strip our batteries out and wrap our batteries in tape and everything even though we all know as divers that you know modern batteries are safe to travel with and the charging ports when you when you turn them or when you disconnect the head you can't charge them accidentally they were real gung-ho about it um Pete had his scooter with him and I think he was with him for an hour and a half trying to convince them that his scooter battery was okay to go. So, wow. yeah, there's one going to. Okay, from Gideon, um, what was the duration of the dive expedition and what are the dive times spent on the wrecks? Um, okay, I think I did 10 days, maybe, I think 10 days of diving I did for this one. So that that came out at about a 15 or 16 day trip with all the travel because it was you know i had to stay overnight in guam um i lost the day on the way there um i gained a bit of time on the way back but i had to sit in tokyo i had to spend a night in guam on the way back i had to spend a night in ebay ebay on the way back so i got off the boat i was stuck in ebay then i 
took the boat over to Quaj, I flew up to Guam, I stayed in Guam, we had a whale of a time in Guam, by the way, but, and then it was, it, it's, it's a long trip. The travel, without the overnights, um, I calculated my travel that just travel, this is not um, downtime. So this is the flights, this is the, and the, the um, walking around the airport, getting the little ferry, getting the boat to Bikini was 81 hours, right? And then just add in an overnight here or there, or two overnights, you suddenly see you've got five days. What was the other part of that question? Um, Dive time spent on the actual wrecks. Okay, so the week we went on, I, I don't know what Pete and Aaron offer in terms of open circuit, um, but we went on rebreather weeks. I, I'm pretty positive Pete was rebreather only because they scavenge oxygen. So they have a pump that sucks in air and scavenges the oxygen off and then pushes that into, into, a, um, into a Haskell and then pumps up the cylinders. They, they actually don't take tons of gas with them. They take helium with them because obviously you can't scavenge helium. Um, so in our rebreathers, we were running 91% oxygen. So we had to calibrate on, on 91. We never had 100% mix, um, but we did have oxygen. Uh, for open circuit, we, we didn't see any open circuit divers, but I can tell you that pretty much every dive that we did was a three hour duration. So if you were the last ones in the water, you'd be the last ones out the water. And the, the dirty bastards, what they do is when you were floating on your decompression, because the currents are not wild out there, the decompression station was on the boat. So you were underneath the boat. What they do is they tip their old softener lime all over your head. So you'd come out the water just, you know, you'd wash for four hours with softener lime coming out of everywhere. But there wasn't a single dive where I didn't spank my canister, you know, completely gone. So it was a, it was a new fill every dive. We did two dives every day. Um, barring the one day where I missed the two dives. I missed one afternoon dive and one morning dive because of the skin bed. Okay. Um, from Gideon again, how far is the, sh uh, sorry, how far from the shore was the epicenter of the blast? Oh, interesting question. I don't know. Not, not that far in the grand scheme of things. Um, if you looked at that photo that I showed you with the boat going up the middle, you, that's taken from the beach, right? Um, and that, I, I think that's, uh, that's, that's Baker. Um, it wasn't far, it was in the, in the bay. Um, I, I remember going over the crater, um, cause you can see the water go from that beautiful turquoise to, to dark blue over the crater. There's, there's bugger nothing down there. So we didn't dive it. Um, but, uh, it wasn't far from the shore. I don't know. Less than a mile, I guess. I, 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 I genuinely don't know. So I'd stand corrected, but it seemed like it was just there. And in that photo, it, you know, it doesn't look that far, maybe a couple of miles, maybe. Um, sure. certainly, it's close. yeah, yeah. I've left Mike's question out because Russ has re-asked it. Um, roughly the total cost of the bikini trip versus a truck trip. Hmm. Would you know? Um, well, funny enough, I've been researching, I'm um, running a trip of my own next year to raid, uh, I mean to raid, to, to truck. Um, and I think truck excluding flights is coming in after all of your extras and everything <clears throat> i think about six and a half thousand seven six and a half to seven thousand dollars um but obviously i'm going with i'm going with aaron so i want to go on one of the dirty dozen trips because i get the expertise of all of those people i'm not there are many many trips to to um to truck where you you, you, you might not get that kind of expertise and and looked after to that degree um i would say bikini now I wouldn't, I, I, I wouldn't be shocked if it was $10,000. Um, but again, if you want to find out um, more about these things, if you do look at, Pete, at Lust for Rust and you do look at the Dirty Dozen, they, they're the only two guys that I know that I'm friends with that run these trips. Um, if you look on the websites, it's, it's not hard to find the information. Um, and uh, as I say, I, I want to run a, a, a trip to truck. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty positive I was right and, around about six and a half thousand dollars and it's plus your flights so they're not cheap unfortunately but they are you know wonderful you, you've heard my voice so this is never going to go away it's like imprinted in my gray matter like it's dna now that's incredible um there's lots of thank yous coming in but then from um from greg in pe are all the explosives not unstable 
Um, no, um, there's a lot of heavy explosives that are gone, um, but there was a lot of light explosives. Um, much like, um, you know, if, if you go to Malta, um, Malta is basically um, the truck lagoon of the Mediterranean. There's literally wrecks everywhere, like everywhere. Um, and they are not sanitized in any way whatsoever. So um, the South World, for example, there are big shells, small shells, um, depth charges, missiles, 50 cows that are lying everywhere. And um, in all the years that I've dived there, which is now, I've, do, I've been doing the wrecks of Malta for, I don't know, 15 years. There's never been a single incident. Uh, in actual fact, one of the wrecks that I dive in Malta has got, it's a, a Schnell boat, which is a torpedo, a German Nazi um, torpedo boat. Although it's very wrecked, it's two tor torpedoes. Uh, one is still sitting attached to the hole, one's off to the side. If you go and poke your nose around the front, the two torpedoes are in with the fans on the end. You can see the red paint on the end of it. And the, the wow. trigger assemblies have still got the aluminium wire with the, with the, the, the stamp um, it, on, on there for when you, you break it and you, and you fire it. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm sure there's a, a one in a million chance that something could go off, but uh, no, I, 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 I seriously, seriously doubt it. I mean, I, I was in Italy and I, 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 I was with uh, my buddy Jamie and I, there was a whole pile of boxes and I actually touched the one box and the box disintegrated and about 200 hand grenades fell out and rolled down the, <laughs> rolled down the side of the boat. I'm still here talking, so. <laughs> <laughs> wow. A um, couple more questions have come in. At what depths do these wrecks lie? Are there any radiation concerns and are there any three-headed sharks? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no three-headed sharks, although... Um, although the sharks weren't a problem, um, they are, they, they think slightly differently, that's for sure. Um, the depths are all in normoxic range. Um, so you're talking, uh, you're kind of uh, up to 60 meters. Um, there are some shallow stuff, but to go out there and really enjoy it, you need to be a normoxic rebreather diver. So uh, a mod two, um, capable of handling normoxic trimix inside a rebreather, because then you'll, You'll, you'll get the most out of your rebreather. You'll, you'll be able to use the scrubber time to its maximum. You'll be able, you, you'll, you'll be able to decompress as long as is allowable. Um, and you, then you get to really experience the, the fun of the wrecks. Um, that's the problem with going out here on open circuit because open circuit is just, it, it, you know, it's, it's, you, you're just incapable of, of, of doing these three hour dives two times a day. Um, I think when Pete was telling me about when he did run some open circuit dives, uh, the guy started doing deep air, which he, you know, he was like, Jesus. And he said, but otherwise, he said, it, it takes me hours to put the Trimix into a, a, a pair of twin 12s. He said, it takes us, and for one diver, it takes us, he says, it takes us the same dive to do um, a whole crew of uh, rebreather divers because we were talking two or three liter cylinders. So, yeah, no yeah. most three headed sharks uh, and 40, I would, I think around, around about 30 odd to 60 meters. I seem to remember most of the dives being in the 45 to 60 meter range. Okay, and radiation concerns? None whatsoever. No, we, we checked it all out. Um, you can Google it. There, there, are, there are no radiation issues, um, which, which um, you know, I don't think that they would like people to be living on the islands full time right now, um, but there certainly was no issues. And, I, I, I've cut myself recently and it's, it is red. It's not green. <laughs> it doesn't go in the dark. <laughs> uh, from Anand, is the dive time of three hours, including the deco stops? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So we were doing about, um, 50 odd, 60 minute bottoms, um, and then paying the penalty for that. Um, you have to, the, the problem with going to a place like this is, it is so easy to do that decompression. There's a decompression bar. So you can hang it like washing if you want. Um, sharks come up and visit you, so it's not boring. Um, I took a, um, one of those H2O things. I, I, I'm talking a while ago, so I put my iPhone in it and it had hydrophones in it. Um, uh, my buddy had one, Simon Mitchell had one, and I watched, um, I watched the whole series of 24, Jack Bauer. I watched that on my <laughs> decompression. So I just leave it hanging on the decompression bar. When I came back, I'd just put it on and I'd just watch movies and 
eventually I, I got so used to it I just used to take my handset off and stick my handset on the side of the of the uh, of the display my headphones on my hydrophones on and watch Jack Bauer killing people it was, it was brilliant <laughs> the thing is because the water's so warm because it's so comfortable because the logistics are so well taken care of you wouldn't notice if you were doing a five-hour dive right because it's just so not boring um, for those of you that have done decompression like in green water or or brown water when you float in there and you can't see anything and nothing swimming past you barring plankton it's incredibly mind-numbing whereas you know on some of these dives at the six meter bar you can still see the wreck so you know you, you, you're kind of sitting over it so we got warned don't push that bottom time because you know there's going to come a stage where someone gets bent and of course i got bent because of a gradient factor thank god so it didn't trim anyone's time but it did it did wake us all up a little bit Absolutely. Um, and then from Gabby, after Guam, was it small planes where you had to use soft bags or did they accept boxes? Oh, no, they, uh, Gabby, they absolutely ex uh, accepted boxes. Um, I, I, I have started putting my JJ in, um, in a soft bag. And I've, I've, I've put foam and they've recently started making rebreather bags um, that you can, you, it's almost like pick puck pick pluck foam inside where you can pluck it out and you can make the shape of your rebreather they, they're absolutely fabulous but at that stage there was none of that so my my stuff went in, in in actual fact that photo where i was sitting on the deck putting my rebreather you can see my oceanic um, alligator box sitting next to me awesome paul thank you so much for an amazing talk i haven't read all the thank yous that have come in there's been a whole stack of them thank you very much and then if you can bear with me, um, next week, guys, we're going to have Chris Bartlett speaking to us about Papua New Guinea and St. Helena, which I know are destinations which are on many people's bucket lists. So that's going to be awesome. Who are you waving at? Bye, guys. Guys, thank you so much. Uh, it's if an you pop on and say hi to Paul, now's the time. I'm, I'm done. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot, Paul. Uh, thank thanks, you very Paul. much. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. If I, can, uh, if I can just thank you all for uh, taking your time out on this uh, Thursday evening to come and hear an, an old tattooed geezer prattle on, prattle on about Rex. Uh, honestly, uh, astonishing to see 60-odd people come out and, uh, and take the time out of your busy days um, to listen to us diving. Hopefully, it's inspired you a bit. Uh, Sebastian has just Seb. walked in the room. Seb, he's just walked in as if on cue. <laughs> 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 um, but um, seriously, from uh, the bottom of my heart, thank you very, very much for uh, taking the time out. Bye, Seb. <laughs> he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Thanks, Paul. Thank you. And uh, let's let's hope uh, I get to um, um, things relax and I get to get out on my usual Christmas holiday and get to see some of you guys and maybe go for a splash, eh? Inshallah. Really amazing, amazing. <laughs> let's hope it happens. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, guys. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Bye, bye, Paul. Cheers, Thank Paul. You Cheers, Paul. Okay. Hello, bye, -bye. Bye. 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 Thanks, Karen. Bye. Thanks, Paul. Bye.